Hello and a very warm welcome to the DRUM Digital Transformation Festival. My name is Lynn Lester and today I feel extremely lucky as I am joined by three industry experts who are going to guide me and you through the digital transformation footprint in the automotive sector, how far it's come, what as marketers we can learn, and then we're going to roll out the crystal ball and look into the future to see what is next. So without any further ado, let me introduce the panel. I think we can maybe do a bit of a round robin here. So Sefi, if you wouldn't mind, could you tell everyone who you are, what you do, and a little bit about CarWow? Of course. So my name is Sefi Rani. I'm the, the commercial lead for CarWow. Um, CarWow is a, is a new car marketplace with the largest new car marketplace in Europe. Um, to give an indication of what that means in terms of sort of channel size, in the UK, we sell about one in every eight, one in every nine new cars. Um, so quite a significant single channel. Um, my role and responsibility, I look after everything from commercial, media, data, integration, partnerships. Um, and before joining CarWow, I worked for Audi in the UK, Germany, and some international markets. Well, thank you. And thank you for being part of this today. And Marcy? Hi, um, Marcy Perez. Thanks for having me. Um, I am the Associate Director at Cadillac for media and performance marketing. So we manage all things from um, audience targeting to um, 360 plans with CRM, media, digital experiences, you name it. And last but certainly no means least, Allison. Hi everybody, it's great to be here. I am the US Chief Marketing Officer for Nissan. So I've been with the company for several years. I was, I've done work um, in Japan and was in Japan leading our global marketing and now I'm back in the US leading the team here. Brilliant, well a, a vast range of experience. I'm sure we're going to get lots of insight from you so that is the plan. So I thought the good place to start really from the beginning if we can uh, reset and think about the kind of car buying trends from what it used to be to what it is now. So you know, if you go back, you know, I'm sure you'll agree, it took about four or five trips to the dealership. And, and I have to say firsthand, I know what that felt like because my sister was a nightmare. So she would drag me into the dealerships. We would literally spend all day where we could have been charged rent. And she test drove the cars. She asked questions. She sat in it. She smelled it. She touched it. And it was literally every sense evoked in that dealership. But if you kind of fast forward now to the current day, you know, given the fact that we were all remote for a very long time, according to Think by Google, it takes around about 24 touch points before someone will part with that hard earned cash. So really just to sort of get us started, it would be great. And I'm going to start with you, Seppi, to, to sort of get a feel for you in terms of how, how, how the trends have changed, what you've kind of spotted, and, and for each of you to sort of give a feel for what it's like in your own markets, you know, what, what the differentiation might be. So Seppi, I'm going to kick off with you. I think, um, yeah, buying habits have, have certainly changed. Um, I think we, we've seen a, a gradual reduction of visits to the showroom over the last five, ten years anyway. Um, even when I, when I was still at Audi, we know it reduced from about eight on average, eight different visits, potentially to different dealerships, down to less than two. So at the time, we thought it was about 1.6. Um, on the other side of the fence now at CarWow, um, there's a lot of information on offer for, for consumers to, to digest. I think the, the biggest shift, though, is, is users look for um, unbiased editorial. Um, everyone's website rightfully puts their product in the best light. All of our products look glossy. They look fantastic. It's a great source of information to, to validate and check spec. Um, but, you know, um, we, we see a huge number of users uh, and a big, big following for automotive content. Our YouTube, for example, is the, the world's largest automotive YouTube. It does about 75 to 80 million views a month. That is a huge number of people looking to either engage because they like cars and they're very passionate, but for the most part, it's buyers really trying to find that in-depth review um, from a third party. So that's one of the biggest shifts we've seen. Um, probably less engagement with, with brand-created content directly. Um, and as such, lots of brands partner with influencers of all levels as well as publishers. Brilliant. I would agree I think... with what Sappy. I uh, want to go, Marcy. Just... I was just going to say, just to jump in, agreeing with uh, what Seppi had to, to say, and I think the the typical consumer is now coming to a dealership so much more informed because of third-party content or things that they've seen, reviews, just conversations with consumers. There's so much data and information out there. I think as marketers, our job has been 
um, it's a little different to look at your traditional KPIs and say, what's happening on my website, when really we wanna know what's happening everywhere else, right? Because that's really a, a critical turning point of how do you influence the content that other people are saying about you versus just what you're wanting to tell people about your product. So it's, it's a real shift in, I think, marketing because consumers have um, this general curiosity to find information on their own from different sources. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a good point. And I am going to come to content in a minute. So Alison, what about you? What, what's your kind of view on that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I think these are all trends that we've been seeing over the last several years. Um, I, I think the biggest shift right now is that the car buying process is now solely in the hands of the consumers. I think what we want to do as OEMs, we may have all these great plans, but if the consumer trends change, you know, the idea of, you know, experience law, once that changes, that becomes the new benchmark and the new baseline for consumers. And that's what we're seeing now, especially when you're looking at online retailing, which has been happening in you know, every other industry, but you know, the automotive industry, it hasn't been as pronounced as it is now. And then I think also the different touch points of where consumers are gonna be engaging with content. It doesn't just live on our OEM owned channels. It's gonna be outside in all of those places. So how do we connect those experiences? How can we, you know, as Marcy said, how can we actually try to influence the things that don't live on our platforms? Or maybe sometimes we don't because that can also provide some transparency. But then also how do we connect those experiences for consumers so we are able to bring them along, um, you know, as they're going through that shopping process. And then, you know, most importantly now, how do we do that in an ever-changing regulatory environment around privacy? Um, so I think it's it's all happening. It's all happening and changing very rapidly. Um, you know, and in some parts we need to catch up, and then in other areas we need to kind of leapfrog what maybe some of the other industries are doing when it comes to retail. I think that's a, I think what Alison. You know, the point she makes around benchmarking versus other industries is really interesting. I think one of the the pain points to working in automotive is the fact that we are it's a very archaic industry right and and you know yes. what, we, what we see as innovation might be innovation in oem world but certainly isn't from a consumer point of view if i've been able to order my goods online or even pay my you know council tax in the uk or whatever on an online portal but i can't pay for my deposit for my car online yet this is this in you know innovative brand we're talking about new technologies it, it doesn't it doesn't connect from the consumer perspective and i think that's a big thing that you know our industry unfortunately seems to seems to not be able to see um the expectation doesn't come and the benchmarking certainly isn't from automotive it's from every other industry yeah and it's almost like you have to take the basics of cpg and start to apply them and yeah. it, i think there are some parts of of automotive that are archaic exactly how you said especially in the actual buying process piece of it and then in other areas that are so advanced that it's things that you can't even imagine that consumers are going to be able to do with your car, with their cars, that's going to be coming in the very near future. And so I think it's about balancing those two things. I think the reality is that most of the large manufacturers, well, all of the large manufacturers, you know, we are very good at manufacturing. We can manufacture sheet metal. And it's now how do we apply what's happening from a consumer experience standpoint and a consumer shopping standpoint? How can we take those trends and apply it into you know, this very mature model? Maybe, maybe, let's not call it antiquated, but maybe it's the more mature model. How do we start to, to really reconcile those two pieces? And I think it's just, it's a fundamental discussion that we have on a daily basis about you know, kind of trying to, to really balance these two things. I guess the, the the biggest pain point, like it's also understandable why the industry is, is in this position. We have a legacy value chain. We have retailers, we have a national sales company, we have a factory. It's very, very hard to break that down. And, and you know, yeah. we see Tesla as innovative in terms of customer process, but in terms of the wide industry, Tesla is not that innovative. Being able to buy your car online or send leads is, is completely normal to a consumer. It's just because they're not tethered down or anchored by this huge legacy systems, processes, people, resource. Um, and I think we're, you know, the, the industry is holding on to that for as long as possible. But you know, this year really does feel like the year that things had to change, right? Out of necessity. Yeah. 
I do think one thing though, um, with regard to, uh, you know, not just the processes and the systems, but buying a vehicle is very personal and very customizable. So the configurations compared to, you can buy a cell phone, right? You want this model or that model. There's no customization on that. The customization comes with your phone case um, where you get into car buying and there's different packages and different you know, options available that um, from an online purchase perspective, just further complicate you know, how, how do you build it in a way that's simplistic for a customer, um, but also very personal and detailed because it is a very big purchase, right? And so I think that there's um, a reason, a, another reason why um, the retail, the online retailing space gets so complicated and in just that the available options that we make to our customers it is, you know, almost indefinite, so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, you've touched on so many points. Actually, I probably could tick off all my questions. You know, you cover so much ground. So thank you for that. So one of the things I'm really keen to know, and I'm sure the industry at large wants to know this kind of stuff is, you know, what kind of innovations, what practical things are you doing then to sort of encapsulate and steal the hearts and the minds to really trigger the emotional and the rational? And I know, obviously, you know, Marcy, I'll come to you first. You know, I know you've got Cadillac Live. It would be great for, for you to tell people what, what even is that? And how has that sort of moved over the, the sort of time that you've implemented it? Mm -hmm. So Cadillac Live came to life um, Q4 of 2019, and we did it as a pilot um, to really draw on that connection, that personal connection that people feel talking, you know, one to one with the human. I think oftentimes people get um, frustrated with um, phone calls or emails back and forth and customer service that when they really just want to talk to a person. Um, and so we um, developed Cadillac Live, which is a website where you can talk live with a product ambassador about any one of our products. We have oftentimes a lot of our future um, vehicles there as well in the, in the showroom. Um, and it allows you to talk one-on-one -on -one where you can see the ambassador, you can um, get a walk through the vehicle, they can talk about your specific questions. It's not a, a pre-taped video, it's not you know a canned speech that the ambassador has to say these five things. It, it truly is a conversation so that you can get all your questions answered. Um, and, and they even have props, things like strollers and golf clubs. And you know, if you want to see how much space is actually in the back, um, you know, they'll get in there and show you their leg room and tell you how tall they are. And um, so it's a very custom experience where you can just have a dialogue. Um, the product specialist can't see you. So there's a little bit of privacy there. So you don't feel creeped out that someone's in your living room with you. Um, so it's, it's really helped us engage our consumers on a new level where we can have those personal conversations. And on average, we're seeing, you know, up to, you know, six to 10 minutes of engagement with people. So they're, they're spending a lot of time, which from our perspective, we're finding much more valuable than a 15 second pre-roll or, you know, a 60 second commercial spot, right? So there's, there's real dialogue and engagement there. And um, it's really helped us. I think bridge that that empty space that the pandemic created um, dealerships closing down customers not wanting to leave their houses everybody's in quarantine and there's still you know even from an owner experience you know what do I do with my lease ending what do I do you know how do I service my vehicle all these questions and so we've leveraged the platform for owner benefits as well. So if you have owner questions and concerns, you can absolutely use the platform for those types of conversations while our dealerships were closed. And so it, it really provides a lot more flexibility to the consumers um, time, you know, time management. So if they're, you know, nine o'clock at night, dealerships are closed, can't get a hold of anybody, you can jump online and actually talk to a human again for anything that you have. And Alison, are you doing anything specific? Yeah, so we have, we have also launched similar program. I think we're, this isn't something that we're doing 24 seven because we've seen that there are kind of very set milestones within the purchasing cycle or within the shopping process where people are engaging with that. So we started actually doing this last spring um, when we were launching the all new Sentra. We've also done this for Rogue. So it's appointment-based scheduling. It's aligned with when, both when we're revealing 
new vehicle. So if it's not even quite in market, we, we do set up those kind of one-to-one -one and one-to-many experiences, but then also right as the vehicles are going on sale. So times like model year transitions or when we're bringing the next generation of a product to market, like we did this past fall with the road. The other thing that we've done is we've actually extended this into our dealerships. And so I think, you know, one of the things that, and, and Seppi brought this up as well, is that some of the some of the parts about being in a mature market is that you also have some regulatory things. And here in the US, our dealer network is incredibly important. They are important partners and they're important a part of the customer shopping process. We also need to make sure that we're working with them to make sure that they're able to meet consumers where they are as well. And so what we did with our live platform is, is work with our dealerships around the country. And we have 1100 dealer, Nissan dealers in the US is work with them on setting up Facebook lives actually, and doing a very similar thing as what we're doing on you know, the national site and actually just setting up one-on-one -on -one appointment based or one to many Facebook lives where they're going through doing walk arounds during the time of COVID, you know, when I think there were a lot of lockdowns, also talking about what they were doing at a dealership level to make sure that they're, um, you know, like all the safety, the health and hygiene precautions that they're taking as well. And I think that's what's interesting. I, again, it comes back to now we're meeting consumers where they are. So if it's in social media, it's something that's more on their terms versus just kind of blasting out a one size fits all message. Yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. It's all about the customer, isn't it? It's all the customer centricity. It's not about it's not about when it suits you, it's when it suits them. You know, it could be to your point, Marcy, in the evening when they've had a hard day's work, it could be in the morning, it could be whenever. So no, that's really great to hear. And I think that will just continue to evolve. And, and one of the things I did actually want to come back on, and Sefi, I'm going to ask you about this, was, you know, you, you touched on content, non-brandy content. So, so, you know, amazing. People will be checking reviews, of course. You know, I think that's always kind of been the case. But how, how do you create, if you're a, an automotive business, how do you create a non-brandy content strategy? Because ultimately you can't predict what's going to be written about you. So if you get bad press, is, is, do, do you see it as, any PR is good PR, or how do you, how do you tackle it? What do you do? Definitely not the view um, of, of most people. Um, that there can be such a thing as bad PR, most definitely, first and foremost. <laughs> um, in terms of the, the strategy for it, I, I think first of all, it's taking a you know an approach that to give an honest, incredible view. There are going to be good points and bad points about every product. We need to you know take ourselves out of our roles and put ourselves back in the consumer's shoes. You know, there are products that I've bought. In the last month, there are things I love about them. There are things I don't necessarily love about them, but they'll mean different things to different people. So it's it's not that bad a thing. You just need to give an honest review and let people digest that information and choose whether your product is for them or not. In terms of how you build it into a, into a strategy, I think you know, talking personally about what we've done. So, you know, Voxel works very closely with us to, to tap into our editorial expertise. You know, there's a reason that our, our YouTube channel has got to the size it has. It's all completely organic. We never pay to drive any traffic for those views either. So finding publishers that seem to understand how to package information in a way that consumers choose to engage with it. It's one thing to make someone sit through a YouTube pre-roll ad for five seconds and quickly as possible press mm -hmm. skip. It's another thing to get someone to sit through, as we did with Voxel. Um, I think the view through rate was about a minute and 10 seconds of, of a minute and 30 second, essentially sponsored content. That is, that, that's what brands can do. Find a publisher that can help put your product um, in front of consumers in a way that they choose to engage with it out of free will. The engagement, the results that you get from that will be completely different to, to paid yeah. advertising. Um, yeah, we worked really well with Voxel. We think it's about making the education fun. In this case, it was about EVs, a daunting topic. For, for the mass market, a bit different for first movers. You know, you want to show people you're driving something cool. You're willing to take the risk of the technology not working. But as we transition into mass market for EVs, the vast majority of people, this is really scary. You know, I'm buying a new car, which is the second biggest purchase for most people, unless you buy a boat. And I'm buying a new technology, even more scary. So giving them a way that they can um, digest that content in, in a fun, upbeat you know, easy way is exactly what we've been helping brands do in the UK. Um, and I would urge um, automotive companies to sort of step out of creating content ourselves and just tap into the expertise that's already out there. Yeah, it's more yeah. authentic, isn't it? 
Sorry, Marcy, on you go. No, I was just gonna jump in. I mean, we are um, all on board with that as well, Sepi. I think um, understanding your audience and then finding the right people that are relevant and trusted for those audiences is going to be so much more valuable to get their honest opinion, right? Again, you don't wanna force the hand, but I think when you can take some of the insights that we have with all this amazing data that digital provides for us and use it to really influence what is going to be most relevant when you're producing that content and who are the right people to speak about something like that, right? You wanna make sure that it feels authentic um, to their, their audience as well. And, and I think there's a really nice way to combine um, you know, what you're trying to educate people on, especially in the EV space as we come along um, in this journey um, versus like what that benefit from a customer perspective is and, and really educating them about, you know, infrastructure and, and how, to, how it all works and how, how to make it less scary, right? Because it, yeah. it is a big decision for sure. I mean, I think a lot of our conversation at the moment is obviously around that acquisition piece. So it's how you draw people into the fold, how you get them to part with their money. How do you how do you retain business? So, you know, you're doing all this cool, innovative stuff. Have you got an eye on the ball when it comes to retaining that customer? And, and if so, what kind of things are you doing? So, Alison, I would love to kind of hear from you on that. Sure. And I think from a loyalty standpoint, I, th I think the, the biggest driver of that is product. Um, and so I think it, it's the product life cycle thing, which I think is this, you know, this is something that, that does need to be addressed within the automotive industry, especially when you're looking at markets like China, which actually has a much more rapid product life cycle cadence. So I think product is, is the beginning piece of that, but how do you keep nurturing? I think it's about, you know, as they get into the brand, it's about simplifying the process, simplifying the ease of doing business. And that's where digital can really play an important part. So simplifying the number of apps that they have. They should be able to make a payment and kind of check in on maintenance and make appointments. I mean, these are kind of basic things, but you know how we've evolved as a company and how we've kind of done knee-jerk reactions to some of the digital trends means that we have a little bit of a disjointed experience. And I think for us, let's create a much more simplified experience for consumers, keep delivering on great product, keep surprising and delighting them throughout the time of their, you know, throughout their ownership period. And I think those are the things that are really going to advance, um, you know, the, the loyalty rate, which I know all of us are really working for. Yeah, absolutely. I think as well, it's, it's really, I suppose, getting to the sort of personal level with that customer, isn't it? They're no longer a customer. You need to know the person. You'll be talking marketing about human to human, which is kind of like a no brainer, of course, it's a human. But, but for so long, marketers didn't necessarily think like that. And, you know, Seppi, I don't know if you want to step in here, but, you know, we talk about convenience. So buying for convenience, obviously, it's emotional, it's rational, it's vanity, it's all these different things. But convenience is obviously a key part. So, you know, it comes to things like subscription models. Like, what, What's your view on that? What are the pros and cons? And do you think it's a, a sort of revenue purchase model that's here to stay? I think ultimately... Yeah. Subscription means that there's more choice for the consumer and more choice for the consumer as a consumer is a fantastic thing. Um, in terms of has it landed well, have we, have we seen a brand really hit volumes with a subscription model? I think the jury's still out. Um, I, yeah. I think lots of brands are playing with it. They're, they're heavily funded. They know it's, you know, brands know it's, it's an area of interest. So for example, I worked on launching um, Audi On Demand in the UK. In Germany, we had Audi Select. There's lots of varying models. I don't think any of the models have yet got to the right price point to, to really work. They, at the moment, sit awkwardly between daily or monthly rental and, and leasing cars. So a lease can be as short as 24 months. Uh, a rental could be three months at a good rate. Subscription kind of sits in the middle and it's not as cheap or flexible and it's not definitely not as cheap as leasing. So I think until we, we, we get the price point, you know, it, it's gonna be really difficult. Having said that, there are different ways. It's not just about price, it's also about perceived value. So there are some really good offerings like Renault in the UK um, are launching uh, an all-inclusive package that helps get people into EV. So for example, I think you can get a Zoe for circa 399, including insurance, tax, any associated maintenance. That is easier because it's not just about the car and it's not a direct comparison to rental or leasing because it includes insurance. Um, and it's just much easier. People may choose to pay the premium for the convenience, as you say, of one single bill coming out of my account and nothing else to worry about. 
I don't want to deal with the hassle of insurance. I don't want to deal with the hassle of anything else. I'm happy to pay that premium. Um, one thing I think did work really well, um, Audi Select, I'm not sure if it's still going, but for, for a short period in, in Munich, you paid a fee to Audi directly. Um, you didn't necessarily subscribe to a car, but you subscribed to mobility. So in the summer, I could drive my lovely R8. Um, in the winter months in Germany, it gets very cold, I can tell you. Um, I can drive my Q7 um, and then I'm going on a long trip away. I can drive something um, a bit random in the middle, like an A6 estate. For me, that was, that was really cool. That actually gave something different and, and look to, to meet the needs of the consumer. It's very difficult to have a one car fits all. Um, that was really cool. I think, I think seeing brands offer something like that could work, but the, the economics of it, you know, you don't want to have every winter 5,000 A5 Cabriolets sat on you. That doesn't work. Yeah. Um, but from a consumer point of view, it's fantastic. Absolutely. I know. And it just can't be one way, unfortunately. <laughs> That would be that would be the nirvana for the consumer. And then, you know, when we talk about how people are buying and, you know, we spoke at the beginning of, of the sort of trends and, and the sort of different ways people look at things. Social buying. Now, I'm really quite interested in this or social selling. So, you know, I, I'll put it out. I, I won't put any of you in the spot. But what, what what's your view on social selling? And do you think that's going to transcend quite quickly into the auto sector? I think I, I can I can kind of start with this. I think the I think I think social selling it's definitely there. The trend is there, and consumers again, it's kind of the next extension of online yeah. retailing. I think what does that mean, you know, again for the second most considered purchase? I think there's still, you know, is, are consumers really going to be able to to where, will they really want that? I think first we need to see are consumers willing to buy fully, you know, kind of in a, in a fully digital world, which I think at least in the in the U.S. The idea of direct to consumer isn't possible due to a lot of the regulations that are here. But how do you set up that experience? You know, if it's through dealership to allow that to happen, I think we need to first see what that looks like, and are we able to get that to scale? And then look at yeah. okay, now do you bring in social? What we've been doing is doing a lot more through social, and and how do you start to connect those different digital touch points? So how do you connect? You know, what were kind of the outdated leads? The idea of the lead. How do you start to have that in social? So again, it's not about forcing consumers onto the manufacturer website. It's meeting them where, the, where they are. Yeah. Anyone want to add to that? No, I, I'll jump in and just add that. Yes, we. I, I think that's a really good point that you just made at the end. Um, we refer to that as outcomes anywhere. And it's not so important um, to be looking on your website. And what are those... Uh, let's say traditional means of success, right? With your key buying actions or whatever that might be, whatever KPI you measure, um, but it is a good outcomes anywhere. And how can you get success across different platforms? Um, and how are you managing that? Yeah, oh, sorry, Sophie, I think you were gonna say something. It's a fascinating area. I think luxury fashion has really paved the way in social selling, um, the ability to buy you know, I worked with Netsporte at one point and they showed, you know, people buying hundreds of thousands of pounds of stuff over WhatsApp. So it's definitely doable, but, but Marcy made a really good point at the beginning of this, saying the complexity of the products that we sell and market are inherently different to a single product. You know, a, a, a lovely Burberry coat, you can get it in, in multiple colors, but they're different variations of the same product in different sizes. It's very yeah. different to specking a vehicle. Um, and, and I think to Alison's point, Social selling definitely has a place in automotive, um, but is it a standalone channel? I don't think it is. I think it just complements, again, yeah. the customer where they want to. They would dip into a conversation on social, perhaps fact check something, ask a question as they're going along. But do I see someone completing the process end to end? I don't think so. Yeah, so that's quite an interesting point because it brings me back to something you had said to me at a, a different call. It was around the perfect journey. So you knew this was going to come back to haunt you. So. You know, from a marketer's lens, your whole sort of raison d'etre is to get every experiential touch point so that you touch the, the, the consumer on that journey. Yeah. But Sefi, you didn't think there was such a thing as a perfect user journey. I'll, I'll, I'll give the pretext to this. Yeah. During lockdown. So I've been back reading um, a lot. And one of my favorite authors is Malcolm Gladwell. Um, Gladwell talks about um, Howard Moskovitz. So he was a marketer that helped many brands in the US 
um, in the 50s and 60s. So he helped brands like Campbell's, et cetera, et cetera, understand a bit more about um, human variability and, and how to create and market products that people want. I think the question that comes up time and time again is what is the perfect user journey? In my view and, and Howard's view and Malcolm's view, there is no perfect user journey, only perfect user journeys. So what I'm trying to say here is we shouldn't ever try to force everyone down one channel. We're all inherently different people with lots of different tastes. If we all had the same taste, we would have agreed by now there's one best automotive brand. They make the best cars and we all just drive exactly the same thing. That's not how we are. We, we all have different tastes. And, and what we should try and do is build a, a core journey with the ability and the functionality for users to either keep staying in the loop, keep staying in the research phase, go forward, go backwards, go from online to offline. But this is very difficult. You know, I, what I've seen um, on both sides of the fence is once a user chooses to go from online to offline, that's a one way road. If you go into a retailer, they try and get you to test drive because you want to do that in person. They'll then try and get you to sign the finance documents there and then and complete the rest of the journey. It's very difficult to, to jump between the online and offline. I think ultimately um, that's what consumers want. They want the free choice. I want to test drive in person, but I do want to go home and read the, the T's and yeah. C's of my finance agreement at 10 p.m. on my own, on my sofa with my partner. Um, and I don't think I've seen any processes that, that let the user do that. It's very difficult to do that. Brilliant. Well, just before we wrap up, I've got loads of questions I still want to ask. I feel impatient to keep going. But I suppose this is, a, this is potentially a controversial question, so I'm not going to put any individual on the spot. But what is the role of the dealership? Are there going to be actual dealerships in the next few years? I'll jump in. I, I think there's a definite role at the dealership. I think our dealer body is uh, the face of our brand. Um, and really, I think their role is to build relationships. It's not to set up test drives and, you know, make sure that, you know, customers are getting through the door and butts and seats and yeah. whatever you want to say, right? I think the, the, the real role is to be a relationship builder and, and truly service our customers to what, whatever that need might be. If it's, an, if it's a question on a future product, great. But if it's also service and, you know, I just need help or, hey, can you give me directions to the nearest store, right? Like whatever that customer needs, they should be able to rely on their dealership uh, to help service that. So I think there is a role. I think, you know, the more that we can encourage our dealers to do the right thing for the right reason, um, I think you will help establish a different feeling that, you know, consumers aren't just walking through the door and, and being like forced paperwork and here, sit in this chair and, oh, let me get you some keys. Like, you know, when you're not wheeling and dealing, if you will, and you're actually just listening to what they need and really being there for the consumer, I think that's going to net you a better relationship and, and a better result in the end anyway. So I definitely feel there's yeah. a need for them and, and, a, and a very specific, important role. Yeah, absolutely. I think it goes back to, doesn't it, it's the human to human. No matter how much we like to do virtual or it's convenient, we like people. I can't wait to hug the next person I see. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Marcy. I think that, that the role becomes less transactional because you can do most of that online. Yeah. People will choose to do most of that online. I don't want to sit there and, and do my, my contracts there. However, I think it's also a great opportunity. It, you know, as it becomes less transactional, it leaves more space for for it to become more experiential ultimately you know this yeah. is a chance our, our, our retailers are a manifestation of our brand we spend so much you know time and effort trying to explain to people this is what our brand feels like this is what it sounds like this is what it would smell like even some brand have done retailers yeah. retailers can be that so it's an, it's a really exciting opportunity to, to perhaps refocus um how we see retailers um and therefore i, I think we'll start to see higher engagement if you can go and, and you know experience what a brand is, that's a more compelling reason than I have mm -hmm. to go there in order to do X, Y, Z. Yeah, absolutely. And sorry, Alison, are you going to say something? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's the, the dealerships play, or our dealers play an incredibly important role. And I think, again, you know, as loyalty becomes more and more important because there are so many choices for, for consumers right now, the, you know, the relationship doesn't just end at the transaction. So dealers will need to play an important role. And I think how do they create that experience? How does it become more about the consumer versus the transaction? I think that's where, that's what we're all trying to work on. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And to round up then, could each of you please be kind enough to share what you think the one prediction is going to be? So fast forward, if we were sitting here this time next year, what's the biggest change you think we're going to see? So Marcy, let's start with you. Well, well I, I mean, just for my alley, the biggest change that we're going to see from Cadillac is our electric future as it comes to life. Um, yeah. All the technology and innovation that's gone into the vehicles is simply amazing. Um, the designs are beautiful. And I think the education of consumers and their true understanding of what an electric vehicle can do for them, that new understanding and found curiosity, I think is going to be something that's definitely going to be something we'll talk about this time next year. Thank you, and Allison? I think, you know, for us, we've been on a complete product offensive. So we, we've we launched 10 new products in the last 20 months. Wow. So I think the product piece we have there now, it's really focusing on that customer experience. So you can do this now and you'll be able to do that at, you know, our dealerships nationwide is to really transact from beginning to end fully online. So I think a year from now, the scale of that for, for Nissan is gonna be quite large. And the final word, Sophie, what do you think? I think we're going to see a, a lot of brands that, that perhaps um, we've not heard of over the last few years start to take really significant market share. That you know, the, the switch to EV means that brand loyalty um, and years of affinity and, and reputation is, is, again, it's reset to zero. Um, and that leaves a huge opportunity for, for brands that don't have legacy systems, processes, even budgets. Um, to launch into the market with a far less complex product when it comes to EV. So it's going to be a big shakeup. It's going to be really interesting. Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure you'll agree that was a pretty damn good session from everything from electric to connected cars to personalization to the future of the dealership. We heard it today and I hope you learned as much as I did. So thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you again next time.